Hello, everyone. Welcome to Measuring Flicks. I'm Carl Hartley. Did I pop the mic? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I'm Max Peterson. He just came so hard. You went so hard at that. I went really hard. Hey, everybody, welcome to Measuring Flicks. <laughs> Want to make sure that they're listening. Well, you know why we went so hard? It's because we've been watching fucking movies about people losing their minds all mm-hmm. month. Uh, welcome to the fourth and final part of March Madness, uh, our series of four films on uh, people going mad, essentially. Essentially. We've covered a lot of ground. We've covered the yeah. drug war. We've covered Stephen King. Uh, not Stephen King. I, it is Stephen King. Hmm. Into the Mouth of Madness. That's not Stephen. Well, it's. Come on. Might as well it's be. It's Stephen King. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, the So today we are covering 2005's The Jacket, starring Adrian Brody, directed by John Mayberry. Don't know why I gave the star first, because who the fuck knows who John Mayberry is? I don't. I don't. But I know who Adrian Brody is. Yes. And I know who Kieran Knightley is. And I know who a very young Daniel Craig is. Like, wow. <laughs> like, that shocked me. It was shocking when he came on screen. I'm like, that's Daniel Craig. I actually was watching it with Danielle for a little bit. She's like, that guy looks a lot like Daniel Craig. I'm like, honey. Look again. That is Daniel That's Craig. That's Daniel Craig. She said shit and walked away. I pointed that out to Bird. I was like, I'm like, Bird, that's Daniel Craig. And she's like, no, it's not. I'm like, yes, he's just 13 in this movie. But right. yeah. He's just 12. <laughs> that is Daniel Craig. And he has really blue eyes. That's how you know it's him. If it's, if it's, you're yeah. if his eyes, if the person's eyes have cut all the way to the childhood part of your soul, that's Daniel that's Craig. Craig. <laughs> uh all joking aside, this movie was depressing as fuck. Yep. <laughs> the jacket was so good. I'm really I've I'd actually never seen this movie. This was one of uh two that I hadn't seen mm-hmm. for this month. Um had this you seen one, this before? This is my pick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think. Okay. Was it? I yeah, don't because I because I remember when we were talking originally about the lineup of films that we wanted to watch. Right, so I did was, Scanner like, March, and Machinist. Yep, because right. and I was like the jacket and and uh in uh, the mouth in, of madness. In the mouth of madness. So I remember just this movie affecting me and having watched it again recently i had no real clear recollection of it it was like watching the movie again for the first time it was the right. feeling the movie gave me when i watched it mm-hmm. was why the the movie immediately came to mind when we said march madness you know people losing their minds but there has to be the jacket with adrian brody right because it's the the sensory memory of watching that movie and being like kind of messed up about it for a while. This movie hit me at the perfect time. Like this was a gr- a great pick just because it's a great movie on the su- on on topic on subject. But I've been reading and listening to so much stuff. Obviously, I'm a fan of the Joe Rogan podcast. I think I've talked about it a dozen times by now. Probably every but um every episode, yeah. <laughs> but um. He he talks a lot about like the sensory deprivation tanks mm-hmm. and stuff, um, and I've always been interested for like the last five to five six years in like sensory depri- deprivation and altered states of consciousness. I do a lot of like um, like deep gnostic meditation to create mm-hmm. like weird altered states. There's a film called Altered yep. States, which we should watch at some point for this fucking um, little show of ours, but. I, I was like steeped in that stuff and then I had didn't really have I knew there was a straight jacket that's all I knew about this movie coming mm-hmm. in and then they like when they they drug him up and shove him in there I was like oh my god he's high in a sensory deprivation tank basically yep. basically basically like he's not because he's you know he's in a morgue drawer morgue drawer the poor man <laughs> <sensory laughs> <poor man's> de- <laughs> we can't tank. afford water or a the tank or any Epsom or salt. Anything. So, so I slipped a morgue assistant a twenty, and he's gonna lock me. In he's gonna draw you up for about fourteen and a half hours on oh some experimental psycho, some sort of psychoactive drugs. drugs. <laughs> uh, um, so this was your pick. What did? What were your thoughts rewatching? It? Rewatching it? Well, like I said, is I, ha, going back and watching it again. Like there were little pieces that I remembered. I remember there's kind of like a time travel movie, but right. not really. But it is. Holy shit! Did that like sneak up on me? Right, and I think that was one of the main reasons why I was like, not only is it about a person that's kind of losing their mind, but he's also time traveling, without the use of anything but just psychoactive drugs and being locked in a morgue drawer. Right. Like, which brings in a lot of real questions oh about God. alternate, uh, like like multiple universe theory and all that kind of if you can right. bring your consciousness to a level of being able to 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 
navigate through that essentially in a corporeal sort of sense like right because he's he he's is physical. physical he's physically when he's there traveling, where he is traveling he's physical physically there that was something i thought was interesting we can get into we'll get into the movie in a yeah, little yeah, bit yeah. but i mean come on that's such a big yeah. big broad idea but uh i, I was just it's listening this, yo, go ahead, the other day to an interview where they were saying that um because they were having an argument about whether the ayahuasca dmt experience because as people say like i went to another place right um uh Rogan and other people have said that they, they've taken powerful psychedelics like mushrooms and gotten into a sensory deprivation tank and then spent – there was one guy, I can't remember his name, who claimed that he had spent weeks in another place. It's like, kind of like that Inception thing. The, the, the deeper down yeah. in the dream you go, the, the time extends and sort of rubber bands out a bit, right? Right, and, but he was saying that he like – he's like, I could feel the earth under my feet and they taught me about their history and they mm-hmm. taught me their language. Like he went to a place and then he got out of a sensory deprivation tank here and now. Right. So – but I like that idea of, you know, like, are these experiences in your head or are they chemical doorways to another place? But if so, how is he corporeally there? I, right. I liked the questions that this raised. I thought they were awesome. Um Bird had one theory and I had another. Bird wasn't really watching, but mm-hmm. she was like kind of in and out and saw a bunch of it. And um her theory was like, so he's he's really time traveling, right? Like this is is he actually time traveling? I don't think that he is. I don't think he is either. I think that what this movie's um, talking about, I, I there's a theory behind it. There's a big like scientific theory, um, uh, but I, I can't. I'll, I'll butcher it. It's because he's moving forward, not backwards. Or he's not affecting anything in the past to alter the future. He's technically affecting the future to. But the electroshock thing would create a paradox, which is why I don't think he's physically, truly time traveling in mm-hmm. an objective sense. Because if he went to the future mm-hmm. and. Uh, Kira Knightley's from... like it's electroshock therapy, and then he goes into the past and says it's electroshock therapy. He, you can't learn things in the future and then tell them in the past right. to create because if he hadn't gone to the future and learned that, there's a specific name for that paradox. They actually bring it up in a Doctor Who episode. It's like if if you went back in time and gave Beethoven his Ninth Symphony and said write this, this is your Ninth Symphony, but. And so then he uses that, like, who wrote the thing but in the first place? Who wrote place, the thing in the first place? Right? Because he wrote it, and then you gave it to him to write. Right. It's no one wrote it anymore. Right. right. So it's that's the electroshock therapy thing. I was like, eh, that's a paradox. So what is an alternative explanation? I prefer to think that this film is kind of exploring the idea of the infinite capacity for computation that the mind has at brain. deep levels mm-hmm. there's a th- there i'll do my best with this theory i'm gonna butcher it but it, this is the idea um that there are some mathematicians who have shown that it is mathematically more probable that we are in an a, a simulation i've read the same thing right so you know what i'm talking about where mm-hmm. basically in the future technology will be so amazing that to learn about history future civilizations will just run an infinite number of simulations of the past to see like how right. people behaved so there will be so many realities generated by these uh, like super technologies that it's more likely that we're in one of those than the one objective than, reality than not right right and also an, an interesting thing that i read just a little blur Mm-hmm. In like after watching this movie, there's a if time travel ever exists in the future, it exists now. Correct, right? Because you can go. It would backwards. have to, right? Right. So if it exists anywhere on a, a single continuum of time, it, it exists, exists everywhere, now. right? Exactly on that continuum of time. Which is, I, I mean, there's all sorts of cool theories about that. Like the like a- ancient aliens are actually future human travelers. <laughs> right, exactly. Like, all that shit gets really yeah. wild and a bit away from but the what, film. But watching a movie like this, it brings up those questions. It makes you right? think about stuff like that. I, if he is time traveling, then what are the what are the What's the ramifications ramifications of of that, that, right? If he's not, how did he come to these conclusions? Well, that's why I like looking at it as though um, he's going into like a deep meditative state with psychoactive – I'm assuming they're psychoactive drugs Mm -hmm. that they're giving him because they shoot him up with stuff and then he like gets flashes. You know, I can lay in a small dark space and I'm not going to get flashes like that. Mm -hmm. But if you bang a bunch of intravenous DMT into me or or if I drop acid. You're going to have some damn flashes. You're going to go flying around a little Mm -hmm. bit. You'll talk to. And your brain is going to start doing these computations that it's maybe not capable of doing when you're not in that state. I like the idea that basically his mind is taking all of the information that it has and it's extrapolating forward as best he can. Mm -hmm. So like. He finds out in the future that he's going to die in a couple days. And I like the idea that his brain is like, well, okay, you're going to get sick from being in the jacket, and but you're learning things in the jacket, so 
that's why the future can't tell him the definitive answer because his brain's his still, brain's working, still working, out the... working out the computation. But once he gets more data by living mm-hmm. in real time and having time to do like what I'm going to call deep meditation in right. the morgue drawer, he has more data to plug into that calculation that his brain's doing and that's how he learns stuff in the future right but although that doesn't explain how he would know about the uh the doctor's the doctor side the electroshock patient yeah well like the he wouldn't know about the he kid wouldn't know all. about the kid and that is the one piece that doesn't make any sense and i kind of want to go back through and watch the movie again and see if there's any time where he would have been to it, like accidentally look at a piece of paper that had the or, or a picture or a conversation that he's overhearing maybe the, and it's the name too it's the name he might, of the he, like I think that I really do believe uh, you know but it's a very specific condition that that patient right. has as well right where this would fix it he knows so many specifics that it almost has to be objective right. time travel. I just don't like that because it doesn't mm-hmm. it doesn't feel as it doesn't feel honest. No, it doesn't feel as as plausible, although mm-hmm. this movie's full of implausibilities. Oh, but clearly, but when you when you put it all in his head and but OK, like there's people call it extrasensory perception. Mm-hmm. But I rather than believing that it's like some woo woo, we're all picking up on like auras and shit. I think that there is some truth to the fact that our minds are so powerful that like when I'm just sitting here talking to you, I pick up m- super tiny cues that I'm not consciously aware I'm picking up on, right. and it fills in some of the blanks of the no- of the information that I'm getting on the surface. Mm-hmm. I think that there's something to that. Have that, sir. We are enjoying in our fine studio today some uh, hot pepper chili chocolate that my wife made. It's really delicious. Good. I ate like a whole bowl of it the other day. That's really why the in- the intro was as loud as it was because it was burning. It was my burning face. your mouth. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I don't know. The I loved the introduction of the time travel component mm-hmm. too because watching this movie and knowing it comes out of nowhere and i knew nothing about it i hadn't read anything I, I love that coming in totally blind especially with trippy movies that are like designed to fuck with you i was watching it and i'm like oh i thought i had it they're gonna put him in there and he's gonna have crazy flashbacks and we're gonna fill in his backstory yes but we don't you don't we jump forward it sets you up for that yeah because you see you see like oh he's in the car in his eyes when they do that weird mm-hmm. flash to his eyes i was not a huge fan of that effect i no. thought it was a bit dated but whatever they flash to his eyes and we see him in the car or we flash and we see the little girl i'm like oh he's gonna remember he has no memory he has amnesia so we're gonna remember but instead of going backwards we're in 2007 which was even weirder because i had no idea what year it was originally originally it's 93 91 or, well 91 in iraq it's, it's 91 in iraq in the 1992 uh i i read it on imdb it oh, takes okay. place over the last two days of 1992 and january 1st right it's over yeah that's, that's right it's over new year's so i like to, i would like to point out this that this film takes place so this could have been a christmas movie oh yeah <laughs> for our christmas month can you imagine can you imagine it's like fucking die hard lethal weapon in this but um uh I thought it was interesting. In literature, there's a thing called a liminal space, space between spaces. Oftentimes, uh, when you do literary analysis, windows, doorways, archways, if characters are doing stuff there, oftentimes it's a big metaphor for moving from one space to another. Makes sense. Liminal, it's called a liminal space. The movie takes place in a liminal space of time. It takes place in the transition from one year to the next. To another. So mm. we literally see him jumping forward a year in real time and also traveling Traveling to the future. So I thought that that was interesting. I'm not sure it must have been calculated, right? You can set this movie anytime. It doesn't have to be like New Year's Eve or whatever Mm -hmm. the fuck. But um, I thought that that was really interesting. And when we find out he's in the future, Kira Knightley, I didn't know what year it was, and he's right. 1992 and 2007 don't look that different. No, they don't. So when he's in the future with Karen Knightley, I'm like, I thought it was a memory from the past. That's what I thought, too. And then he jumps back, and he when he asks her, he's like, what year is this? And she's like, 2007. 2007. And he's all fucking like, what? <laughs> I'm like, what? Well, he finds his dog tags. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, okay, how old is Adrian? Wait, is he out of the hospital, and this is the future? Like, have we just jumped forward? And then we have, but... I, I love that you're like so you're with him. You're with, you're with him. him. You're jarred you're, a bit. You're you're jarred. Not, don't you're know like, where you are. Mm-mm. And really? then when you find out, you realize like something weird is happening. And we jump back, and he talks to uh, 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 Jessica, or, um, Jennifer Jason Lee's character. Yes. Um, and she was, and she's like, you know what year it is, right? He's like, 1992. I'm not crazy. I'm like, 1990 fucking two. <laughs> did you just time travel in a morgue drawer, bro? <laughs> you did. <laughs> 
the uh, I, I love that. A lot of times, I feel like movies dumb themselves the down. The DeLorean, the TARDIS, the, the morgue, morgue drawer. drawer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I think a lot of times movies dumb themselves down for their audience. Like, mm-hmm. oh, a bunch of dummies are gonna watch this, so we're gonna take them step and explain everything. Right, right where this they're one like, doesn't do that. Like they go, they could have put him in the morgue drawer and done like a little effect where we see 1992 in the corner, and then as he's freaking out, it goes. Right. And fast forwards us to 2007. And it's like, oh, now we know where we are. Right. Are you following us, you fucking idiots right. at home? You know, I love it when a movie will just trust you to catch up. Yes. Just dra- drive me forward and show me things. Give me information so I can make inferences. That is what I loved. This movie really treats its- itself seriously. Mm-hmm. And its actors treated it seriously, too. Did you read anything about uh, about? Adrian Brody's I know that he he did uh, some of the machinists as a movie that we're going to be looking at. Looked at Looked last at. week. This that's right. We did. We record out of order, of course, people. You know geez, we do. Okay. So, so we did. We're gonna we're gonna watch the machinists. So uh, so so Christian Bale lost almost like eighty five pounds or something for the machinist. Yeah, he is a bean pole. Yep. Mm-hmm. Adrian Brody did a similar thing in preparation for this because he's supposed to be like an Iraqi war veteran who got injured by a head wound and lost a whole bunch of weight. So he is a – I mean, Adrian Brody is not a big person he actually, anyways. He actually bulked up for this Did movie. he really? Yeah, the pianist, he lost – He was he's a skinny guy. For the pianist, oh, yeah. he lost 30 pounds for that movie. Oh, wow. 30 pounds. Well, he's like ripped in this, but he's like a – he's, he, he's Belt. He went on a big, uh, like a high protein diet to try and put on mass and definition. And you can definitely see the mm-hmm. definition, but he is very thin. I think part of the reason he's thin is because he lost 30 pounds for the fucking penis. Because they even mentioned it, the one of the characters, I think the, the Jennifer Jason Lee is like, you're severely underweight. Yeah. Like it's mentioned. Yeah. By the way, Jen, really quick, but I want to get back to Adrian Brody, but Jennifer Jason Lee, uh, I saw her and I saw the name. I'm like, that's so familiar. And then I saw her face and I'm like, she's so familiar. And right. then the second I heard her talk the second I heard her voice I'm like oh hateful eight yep hateful eight she's the girl in the hateful eight <laughs> yep. who gets beat up for the entire fucking movie and then hung brutally in the end spoilers <laughs> but uh <laughs> you can't spoil movies that we're not talking about that's not fair that's true yeah I'm just gonna be like hey do you guys know how the godfather ends um godfather three Al Pacino dies anyway <laughs> that is true by the way sorry everyone mm-hmm. don't watch the godfather three just pretend it doesn't it's one and two yeah pretend two is the end of it but uh Adrian Brody I had no idea that he's he's not necessarily method right but he's got that method thing bird did some research um because i was just i was uh watching this movie and we were like commenting on how like how visceral his performance especially in the morning his, uh, is. his eyelids look like he's got purple rouge on they're so like that tired exhausted he looks so exhausted looks exhausted um bird exhausted. found out that for the pianist he not only lost 30 pounds he gave away his car and apartment because he want he felt that he couldn't portray uh, a Jew in Germany who had lost everything Without if he was living in this opulent opulent lifestyle. He's like, I needed to experience that that sense of like going without. So he gave away his apartment and his car and lost thirty pounds Holy shit. for that movie. For this movie, um, when Adrian Brody was in the drawer. He talked to uh, Mayberry, the director, and was like, hey, even when you're not rolling, don't let me out of the drawer. On all the days when we do drawer shoots, don't open that door. Don't let me out. You can stop rolling, turn the cameras off. You guys need to go smoke or whatever. Like if you're going to take a break, leave me in the drawer. Don't take me out. Don't talk to me. And he was – Holy shit. So they did shots. They He kept the cameras rolling, but sometimes he would turn the cameras off and they would go and shoot other shit with other characters. Leaving – Leaving Brody Adrian in Brody the... in the drawer at Brody's request so that he could get a sense, in his words, of the character's desperation. So finally, they had like hours and hours of footage of him locked in this drawer and eventually he had a real breakdown in oh, the I'd drawer. Oh, I imagine so. And he was explicit. He's like, if I freak out, don't fucking let me out. He's in a real straitjacket. Yeah. So he can't hurt himself, but he can have a fucking mental breakdown, which he did and they filmed it and that's what you see in the movie. When he's like crying and like twitching and like trying desperately to hold it together that's because adrian that's, brody's been in out. a drawer for like 20 hours oh my god in the pitch black with cameras on him and he doesn't know if he's being filmed he doesn't know if people are even in the room he's in a fucking morgue drawer just locked in you lose sense of time you know if you're yeah. there for five minutes or five hours so like... i thought that was interesting because one of the we've there's actually another famous instance of this martin sheen in apocalypse now 
Francis Ford. Have you ever seen Apocalypse oh, Now? Oh, God, yeah. Fra- that scene when Martin Sheen is in the hotel room and he like lights the sheets on oh, fire and he punches it? the yeah. mirror and he's all drunk as shit. You know how that happened? Dude. Coppola put him in a hotel room with a like I think a bottle of tequila or something, and then he locked and barred the door and shot. You'll notice the camera angle never changes. He was shooting through a tiny uh, reinforced pinhole through bulletproof glass. Shut up. He's filming through the wall, and he just didn't let him out. You can hear, I think in the movie, actually, you can hear Martin Sheen screaming to be let out. But he, Martin Sheen was just locked in there for, like, I think it was days. Coppola just threw him in there and was like, you have a bottle of tequila and nothing else. Oh so he, my like, God. strips. He gets all fucking yeah. drunk. Gets naked. And he punches the yeah. glass. His hand, the bleeding hand that he wraps up, really bleeding, and Coppola wouldn't let him out then. Huh. Like, the, you can see the footage where he comes over and he's like, I'm fucking hurt. And Coppola's like, too bad. Too bad. Wrap it up. <laughs> oh, my God. So when Martin Sheen's losing his goddamn mind in that hotel in that it's hotel Martin room, that's his... Martin Sheen losing his goddamn mind in a hotel room. So, I mean, now that was maybe... Uh, was, that's very extreme. Not his choice. Right. Brody made the choice. Right. Um, he also did a bunch of sensory deprivation tank work to get a sense for what... What that what, would be like. What going that deep into your own mind is actually mm-hmm. like. So I thought that that was really, really, um, really fascinating. A little bit uh, disturbing at the same time. Quite. But uh, what did you, I mean, Adrian Brody is a, gr- this movie doesn't feel like an Adrian Brody well, movie. Well, because it is, I mean, it isn't really. I mean, it's, it's so many different things at once. It's a time travel movie, or is it? Mm-hmm. It's about, it's in that sort of the psychological, psychological thriller. thriller. It's also like a, a who done it because a good majority of this movie is him trying to figure out who kills him, and if, I imagine to, to try to avoid that situation right. from happening. And it's fucking fate that kills and it's him. It's fate that kills it's him. It's accident. Yeah, chance. Um, and I love that the guy who actually killed the cop gets away scot free. We even see him in the end, yeah. just chilling in a bar having chilling a drink. Out. Nothing happens to him. He has the same sort of rosary thing that he's playing with that the Daniel Craig character does. I don't know if you noticed that little detail. I didn't. Dan- yeah, I didn't so even notice Daniel, Craig, Daniel had a Craig is looking out the window when Adrian Brody is is coming back from visiting the younger Kira Knightley, mm-hmm. and that's when he slips on the ice. Daniel Craig's character is watching that, and he's fidgeting with this like lightish green, blue beaded sort of rosary looking thing. Uh huh. And when you see the flash of the person that killed the state trooper, the and he's looking at his reflection in the mirror, he's fidgeting with the same thing. I don't know if that has any significance, but I definitely noticed it. I'm like, why does he have the same thing that, Interesting. that, he, that he has? It has no bearing on I, anything. I kind of wondered, actually, about... Um, not about Daniel Craig's character, but that is interesting because I was wondering if Adrian Brody, if the, all that future shit, mm-hmm. all the, that stuff is happening in his in his head. One explanation for how he would get um, the kid's name right. is that the hospital's in his head too. That he's the hospital and what we think of as reality is a delusion. Right. And in his delusion, he's time traveling. And coming back, Jennifer Jason Lee even says several times, like, these are symptoms of your delusion. Yes. So in his delusion that he's in a mental hospital, he deludes as it gets. But anyway. Right, because there wouldn't be any. Right, because in that case, he would he'd be able to get as much as he wanted from the future because none of it's real. Mm-hmm. Or he died in Iraq. Or he died in Iraq. And this is all in the flash before he dies. Mm-hmm. Or you've just opened the door that there's a possibility that the severely mentally ill guy who shoots the the cop mm-hmm. maybe this is all in his head yeah or maybe you know like it's it's almost it's twin peaksy in a way in, yeah because if now now i'm wondering like is there some connection between daniel craig's character and I just, I, yep. the movie is layers but i wasn't able to uh, pick them apart as as effectively as i was with a scanner darkly probably because i've had a lot more time to sit with a scanner fair darkly. enough yeah but um I don't know. I just thought I, I thought that the portrayals were all really good. I I hate ever to take Daniel Craig to task for anything, but I thought his his performance was a a touch. I'm the crazy Brad person. In you know, monkeys. I, I couldn't help Twelve Monkeys. It was just Twelve Monkeys, right? I'm like, oh, he's Brad Pitt. Yeah, it's Brad Pitt's character Brad in Twelve Pitt's Monkeys. <laughs> it's Plague, Plague of Madness. Yeah, the whole yeah. Oh, right. There's... I'm the I'm the crazy crazy person in in the. 
there's cuckoo's nest. I feel like there are there are crazy people notes. Right. And you when you are tasked with playing an insane person, a person who's like truly experiencing severe like severe um, uh, delusional mental illness, like mm-hmm. like Daniel Craig's character is. There's a couple ways you can play it, and. I think Brad Pitt broke some new ground in 12 Monkeys, and I think Daniel Craig was like, look at all that new ground. That <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you can you can be the twitchy, like, well, you know, I've been recruited by right. the, the uh, organization for the organized or whatever the fuck, you know, like you can be twitchy, and when the nurse touches you, you can flinch away from it. Or there's another way to play it, which yeah. if you listen to our Patreon-exclusive uh, Season Zero, I think Bronson... All of the portrayals of the mentally ill in Bronson are fucking pristine. Right on. Yeah. Oh my god! Especially the cat. Like, there's there are people who are like being weird and crazy, but they're not being Brad Pitt in Twelve. Months. Right. <laughs> and then there are like the catatonic people. But I, I thought Bronson handled the the overall feel, feel of, of, of the, an the, asylum right. better, better than this one did. Well, this one feels like the movie version of a mental institute, right? Like, yeah, you have the perfect way of doing it, which is Cuckoo's Nest, right? You cannot be surpassed. Cannot be surpassed. But then you have the, like, uh, we're going to have, this is the mental institute now. We're going to have the drooling person. We're going to have the person that stares at the wall all the time. We're going to have the person that rocks back and forth. We're going to have the person that's super crazy. Oh, my God, everything's <laughs> theory, theory. Because when they're doing their, like, group session, it's literally the cookie cutter, like, this is, the, all- this is the one that's holding her doll and rocking back and forth. This is There's the one that's- the, Have you ever noticed? I mean, I, I don't want to point it out necessarily, but I'm like, look, it's the overweight woman with unwashed hair. Yes. She's, ev- she's everywhere. She's in every asylum ev- ever. Every asylum ever. There's the woman in cornflower blue. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 300 pounds and hasn't washed and unwashed her hair. hair. And she's, like, doing something with her teeth, usually. Mm-hmm. And you're just like, oh, look, it's you again. They just keep bumping you from asylum <laughs> to one. asylum. How, well, how was you it working with Brad Pitt, know. Bruce Willis, and Daniel Craig? Seriously. That's crazy. <laughs> there, I noticed there was nobody who shat in their hand and then held it and out held it to out. Tom Hardy. Yeah, that was so weird. Mm. More Patreon exclusives for you. Um, the, uh, just to skip back for a second, um, going back to Iraq. I'm not 100% positive, but I'm 99% sure that the boy who shoots Adrian Brody in Iraq is, is the same boy. boy who plays the catatonic person. I think their build is the same character. Oh, my God. So that gives some credence to he died in, he Iraq, died in Iraq because he's populating this world with people right. who were there. That's it's the same. Even in the beginning, it's the like same the, actor, definitely. The 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 doctors think that he is dead. I mean, they're talking about oh, he's from Vermont, but he's like, his, but he's like blinks. I mean, blinks and like oh my god, he's alive, cold blue. The jump was weird too. Because like, it goes from that to him hitchhiking, hitchhiking, right? right? And he's fine. He's yeah, fine, he and he has no the, scar on his head where he was shot in the fucking head. Yep, he has. He helps them start their truck again. The whole and thing. then he gets in with the hitchhiker, right. and then he goes through some weird trauma, and, and then he can't remember right what so, happened. So I don't know. Is this whole movie in his head? If so, now no matter what the correct answer is, who fucking knows? And I bet there's a, a like. I think it's because I mean. If he did die on the in Iraq in ninety one during was a desert storm, right? Yeah. So the first Iraq war. So but, he probably did some pretty shitty things mm-hmm. and things that he regretted like, this and might be so his punishment. This, but the way the movie ends where he's like better now, like he helped somebody, like he sort of atoned for his sins. Even if only in his own I, mind. In, if only in his own so mind. He worked, so he worked through his perceived his feelings guilt. of guilt. Yes. I, I think, think that that's what it is. Uh not to get too political, but I would like to point out this movie takes place. When it opens, 1991, Mm -hmm. we have American soldiers in Iraq coming home, getting thrown into a mental institution because of some weird potential PTSD. I watched this movie in 2018. Today, there are soldiers in In Iraq Iraq. who are doing the same fucking thing. It was like a Scanner Darkly. Scanner Darkly, we're like, we're still there. (laughs) It's weird that all these old movies we're watching seem to be commenting. Commenting on what's happening now. It's almost like nothing's changed. Hmm, wait. I've been told that we're experiencing progress, and yet... Think about that. I mean, there's there was a brief interlude, but and we will get off the subject, I promise. But think about that. There was a brief interlude, but we're in Iraq in 1991. We're in in Iraq Iraq in in 2018. 2018. Think about that. Yeah. That is fucked up. Anywho. Yep. Yes. Uh, Kira Knightley, also very young in here. Yeah. This is right off of Pirates. 
is this fresh off pirates for mm-hmm. her okay i <laughs> wrote down her tuned up face is perfect when she gets drunk yes is that that might be the best one of the hardest things to do as an actor is to play drunk realistically right because everyone goes for i'm drunk now thing uh, fuck you worst worst fucked up you've ever seen can you think of it off the top of your head oh my god i can't i have it. a perfect one okay go for it eyes wide shut Nicole Kidman. <laughs> that is the worst fucked I'm up. So right <laughs> well, they're not even drinking. No, they're not even. They drinking. they smoke some weed. Tom, I, all credit to Tom Cruise. His like first five minutes before he gets sucked into Nicole Kidman's shit storm, his perfect stoned where he's like, "What are you talking about?" Right. Where he's like barely able to talk and he's got this weird dumb grin. Perfect stoned. Yep. And we cut to Nicole Kidman. She's like, and another thing. <laughs> I think the you would be a like she goes like the most sloshed fucked up clown. Yeah, but she's she's playing not just drunk, but like the most drunk ever. ever and she takes yeah. like two puffs off a joint. I'm like, really? Stanley Kubrick didn't didn't no. pump I mean he died, so he probably no, he maybe they filmed that. that after he was dead, but yeah, that's the worst fucked up I've ever seen. Kira Knightley in this movie. Perfect. She's her eyes literally like get glazed. Mm-hmm. And like there's like it's like one of them is kind of drooping a little and her mouth is slack. She does drunk. She, she almost has like stroke face a little bit like. Uh, but it's the drunk stroke yeah. face. Like yep. if you've been at a bar and you've and there's someone who's been like had like four or five drinks next to you when they turn to you right before they start talking. That's the face. That's the face. She's got it. The eyes are kind of tracking a little slower than they should. Right. The but... face is coming or the eyes will like overshoot and come back. Yep. She's she's on. She's so on. I loved that performance. Um, She smoked. You know what? As we spo- uh, spoke. There was about, a lot of smoking cigarettes in this movie. A lot of cigarettes. Like there was just like every scene, five cigarettes are being Everyone smoked. Everyone is like, chief in a stick. Shit. And and uh, given that you have quit four months ago. Uh, yeah. October 4th. Yeah. About four months. I w- uh, not not to throw you uh, into the path of temptation. Does it is it weird to watch people? No, smoke it is. Sometimes? Actually, I, I thought about about halfway through the movie. I was like, holy shit. Are they really going to fucking smoke another cigarette again? And I was like. God damn it! No, go smoke it. I want to watch. I want to watch you smoke that fucking cigarette right, right now. <laughs> right, I because I know a lot of people who have quit, and every time they you watch, you never really get over like. There's some things that I loved smoking cigarettes. I'm right. not gonna lie, and right. like when you're watching movies, like especially like Die Hard, I have a hard time oh watching Die God. Hard because he makes cigarettes look he so good. He smokes a sexy. cigarette. I mean, he smokes the shit mm-hmm. out of those cigarettes, mm-hmm. right? So I have trouble. I I do not smoke. Watching Mad Men made me want to smoke. Right. When you watch There's, Mad Men, you're like, no. Well, it's like watching than everyone a wanted to like be James Dean smoking a cigarette, right? right. There's a coolness about it. There's a machismo Sean almost. Sean Connery like, at the beginning. First thing we see James Bond do is in light movie a history cigarette. Is light a cigarette. And you know what? In Q's God office, damn. right? No, in a casino. In Do- oh, Dr. In, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They come over the Baccarat oh, table. Oh, he's playing Baccarat. And he's like, the right. second you see him, we get. And that and theme music comes up, and he lights a cigarette, and you're like, Oh, oh, James Bond. I'm smoke it. But no, there was a lot of smoking of the cigarettes, and there was like, a, no, go, go ahead, smoke it. I wasn't a huge fan of the, um, I, I, the, I was going to say, uh, to get to back to uh, Winona Ryder from our Scanner Darkly mm-hmm. episode, Kara Knightley smokes a pretty nervous cigarette herself. She smokes a very nervous cigarette. Oh, boy, does she. She does the nervous pulling out, like fidgeting for the cigarette, right. fidgeting her, for the lighter. Her fidgeting the one out, her hands, that it's it's not a handshake. No. It's, it's not a Nicole Kidman handshake. A, <laughs> she she has a fingertip tremor. Mm-hmm. It's like just a tiny. Can't quite get a hold of the ooh. cigarette, can't quite pull it out. Oh, right. it's so good. We, uh, in the seven episodes that you have heard, if you're a Patreon <laughs> subscriber, um, we've we always talk. When we talk about performances, we always talk about little touches. Mm-hmm. And that was an amazing, that little touch is amazing. Adrian Brody's, I think it's, I've never seen, I don't think I've ever seen a character cry on their back before, which is uniquely, unique to this movie. Adrian Brody's laying there and he cries and you get a huge puddle yep, in his it eye. It doesn't, ha- it hasn't leaked out, out yeah. but like there's a moment where there's so much, so many tears in his one eye that like half his eye is obscured by, by, Tears. A pool of tears, yeah. And I thought that that was an interesting touch because it would have been easy for him. Everyone likes the rolling tear. Right. Because a rolling tear is pretty and ho- and Hollywood and film is all about making – like there's the beautiful dead girls syndrome mm-hmm. where even in death women are sexualized. Right. Everyone loves the look of a single the tear rolling. Tier. Right. Yeah. Like Adrian – it would have been easy for Adrian Brody to turn his head. 
just a little bit and get some tears rolling. But he chose to stay with it and lay on his back, and you see him, his eyes drowning in tears. <coughs> I thought that that was a really interesting touch and a really great choice yeah. by him. I thought that was that was really good. Of course, he was he was actually, actually losing having his a, fucking yeah. mind. Yeah, it may not have been so much a choice as he was freaking heading the fuck towards out. Catatonia. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, that was a little bit um, interesting. Speaking of small touches, mm-hmm. uh, I was. I'm a cinematography buff, always have been. Uh, I was not blown away by the cinematography here. Have you seen Rush? Uh, Chris Hemsworth is directed by... um, I don't think that I have, no. Ron Howard. It's the race car movie. No, I did not see that one. Okay. I thought that there... I think that there are better ways... Maybe it's a technology thing because mm-hmm. obviously Rush is 2015, 2016, a lot of technology. The mm-hmm. cameras got a lot smaller. But I think there are more effective ways to shoot people close. And there were there were things I wanted to see. Like in the drawer? Yeah. So have you seen the Ryan Reynolds movie? Um, no. Buried or whatever? But you have recommended this to me and I will watch it someday. It's really, literally, it's Ryan Reynolds in a coffin buried the entire movie. You never get outside of it. Are there any other characters? Or no. It's a, Over the phone. But we never he, see any people? No, you never see anyone but Ryan Reynolds really? in the coffin buried underground. I'm having a thought. We should watch, remind me at the end of this episode, we should watch that and Locke, because Locke is another one-person okay. movie. It's Tom Hardy in a car by himself for Oh, you told me about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So fucking good. But, um, but those, you want to talk about an interesting way of shooting up close yeah. in a confined space? That movie does it perfectly. Where I agree with you, this one's like, you see the, the, the tight shot of his face. I didn't face understand the, the hand. Like, they kept the hand, cutting back cutting to his, his right hand, hand and right. I'm like, does he have a thing he's trying to cut the jacket with? Or is, is it a nervous... Yeah, they Why kept, are we doing that? Like, are, if we want to show him struggling against his bonds, I right. think there are better angles. Is he There's gripping a, a, a rosary that's sort of green and, or Do bluish in color? Do they have blue-green rosaries? Is this a movie about the Illuminati? It might be. <laughs> no, but like in Rush, there's a fucking astonishingly good shot where we um, uh, Ron Howard mounts a Mac uh, um, a GoPro with a macro lens adapted on it inside Chris Hemsworth's helmet, less than an inch from his eye. Holy crap! So we're seeing the micro eye movement. It's not actually Chris Hemsworth, but right. it's a driver. Um, one of the actual stunt drivers who are watching the micro eye mov- movements, and you can see v- the veins in his eyes as it turns, and it's it it's so intense. Wow. So if you want to create claustrophobia, they're shooting pretty fucking wide for, to give me claustrophobia. Right. I liked some of the weird artsy stuff, like getting close on his mouth. Like, for example, when he's in the future and he's talking to the— You get really close on his mouth, we will haunt you or whatever. We will, yeah, and then like they're—yeah, and that too, the uh, the cuts without cu- without changing angle thought that was great mm-hmm. like he says something and then there's a cut but we don't change angle he just moves position and says it again or he moves position and he's mid cry mm-hmm. like that stuff some of the artistic touches i thought were really nice but cinematography there's a moment i always picture it like this out i have to find like one moment when he escapes quote unquote escapes quote unquote. and he's like walking away and they go down that big corridor of trees um I can't remember exactly what I tied it to, but uh, Adrian Brody, the the trees like make this arc like upward, an archway, yeah. kind of like an archway. But so he's in a liminal space again, um, where he's in he's in between the forest and on then, either side, and he's in between the um, it's like a hallway. Yeah, he's right. in between the mental asylum and the and, fence. And the gate, yeah. So he's in this liminal space, but also it makes this like kind of candle flame looking thing, and the way that. We always stay uh, far away until the conversation starts. Right. So he starts as like this tiny thing filling up like a coffin-shaped space, and then he moves for more forward and forward and forward. And the way that it's framed, he starts filling up that that like that light space. That light sp- space, I thought, was representative of the drawer, and he's like f- filling filling that. the drawer. And then uh, the hateful eight girl comes up behind right. him. <laughs> <laughs> Dahmer Goo comes up behind Dom- him and is like, "Hey, you should." Uh, Dahmer Goo. <laughs> you should probably come back inside before you freeze. And I was like, man, always playing that character. Yep. It's just Brad Pitt in it. <laughs> That's too funny. But, uh, yeah, I really liked that. Um, I don't know. I I thought that the – other than that, the old, I thought the old man aging that they did on the, the doctor, the main mm-hmm. doctor, when they made him old, old in 2007, I thought that that was great. I was that was the other thing. Besides, besides the Kira Knightley character, who obviously goes from a little girl to, who goes from a little girl to, an adult, uh-huh. the aging 
There's a lot of people. You're going what from '93 to 2007, right? Right. So that's a jump of time. Right. Yeah. You're looking at uh, like 14 years mm-hmm. or something like that. So you can do that two way. You can like overage someone. So you're like, we've gone in time forward 14 years. Jennifer Jason Lee looks almost exactly the same. But she there's did. there's subtle, subtle aging. T- subtle aging, they right? Which I really appreciate. Mm-hmm. It's like you could have just made her fucking just old. old. It's like it's only 14 years, okay? Right. It's but just the- a couple little extra crow's feet. The hair was a little different. I think they filled her face out a little too. Mm-hmm. Like she's she, a little heavier. She looked a little bit heavier. Like d- just really subtle mm-hmm. touches. I thought that was great. I appreciate it because it could have been like Jennifer Jason Lee turns around and is like she's seventy five. You <laughs> and you're like, huh? Fourteen well, years was not nice to you. Wow, wow. <laughs> you you got into meth pretty seriously. <laughs> yeah, right? I wonder what the old doctor's gonna look like. The crypt keeper <laughs> comes out of fucking church. And he's like, Do I know you. <laughs> no, right. They were subtle enough with yeah. it. Where I thought the aging makeup was really good. One thing I didn't understand. In the beginning, when Adrian Brody is uh, he's on trial, and they're mm-hmm. like, "Do you know we have no address for your so-called friends?" friends. Which I assumed was the the, the girl wasted and the, mother and right. her little girl. In the future, when he's in the future and he asks for her address, I was like, "Oh my God, he's going to get her address and give it to the prosecutors, and they're going to prove that he's innocent." But instead, he's like, "Take me there so I can, so give, I can give a lady note. this note that I wrote on a napkin." You know, it's right. not a napkin, but I'm like. No, call your, thing, call your lawyer. <laughs> call your lawyer and be like, "Look, give him this address. Here's where they Something's live. Something's gonna happen. Yeah, and this and is then what we need. They're gonna be like, "Yeah, we saw him that day. He helped us with our car, and he was totally alone, and uh, he didn't he have was a, hitchhiking. He so. was hitchhiking. So there, we, we are real. But no, he's like, I'm almost. You might dead. burn to death. <laughs> I'm almost dead. Take me." Take me to their house so I can be creepy with a girl that I fucked in my head in the future. Oh, that's the one. That's There's a creepy touch. shit. There's a touch of uncomfortableness because he, there. Because he, he bangs future Kira, Kira Knightley, Knightley. And, and then he's kind of... Then, because she's a little girl when he meets her the first time. That's what's creepy about it. He well, meets her when, and then he... For me, he, yeah. for me, I wasn't so... Okay, he's she's a little girl when he first meets her, and then in the future, like, oh, look, she's grown up, and she is severe if alcoholic. If it's all in his head, then he sort of wanted to bang a kid. <laughs> well, but he, at least he ages her. Fair enough. God's sake. Fair well, like, enough. Actually, Bird and I talked about this the other day, because I met Bird when I was 20, and she was 21, um, so now we've been married, you know, mm-hmm. and we're, you know, I'm 27 now. Obviously, we've been married a long time. We like have sex and stuff. But I, like, we're 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 sexual partners. But right. when I look back, I'm like, man, you were cute in high school. But are right. you allowed to be cute? And you know, like I asked her, I'm like, is that is that weird? You know, and she's like, well, no, because like we're married now, and, and you, you grew at, up together, at right? One, yeah. At one point, we didn't. I met her in college, but oh, like, okay, fair enough. but like at one point, she's like, well, yeah, but think about it. At one point, you were also in high school, so mm-hmm. whatever. I think your like high school pictures are cute. There's a weird, there's a weird line. There sure. definitely is. And when I saw um, Adrian Brody meets the little girl, meets Kara Knightley, I was like, that's. I found it creepy, like how he touched her face and everything. That was in, like a. Well, Ooh. I'll get to yeah. Well, when he like, he, I thought but he that, shakes her hand. So it's not like a sexuality. No, thing happening their, there. their first encounter. I thought was fairly normal. He's he's being comforting, I think, because the mom is so fucked up. So he fucked feels up. bad right, for right, the right. girl, where he's like, "I'm gonna give you some a little bit of tenderness because your mom is clearly fucking awful." Right. Then in the future, she's aged. She's Kira Knightley now. So for me, that was okay because that's like that's how like real life works, right. Right? right? You know, like if you're if you're young and you meet another young person, eventually you're both gonna be old. You're both gonna be of legal age. I'm like, that's fine. When it got weird for me is when we go back to quote unquote reality, and he goes and sees her, and she's a little girl again. Well, I, uh, always has been, I guess. Right. I don't know. Time travel is weird, but when he goes and sees her, and she's a child, I'm like, you. Let's say the time travel is objectively real. Okay. In 2007, you have sex with the woman that this little girl will become, Becomes, and right. you can almost see. I don't know. I don't know if it's there, but you can almost see like a trace of that affection still in Adrian mm-hmm. Brody. I, to his credit, he could have gone either like like weirdly distant with it or he could have gone like full on Freddy Krueger pedophile with it where he's like oh one damn bit but he doesn't right he doesn't there's I think he is as conflicted as we are fair enough because he goes and gives the letter to the mom and on the way out he's like hey you know you can see that he's mourning that he will never know in reality the woman the woman that she will become right 
but on his way out, you can see when he like he like shakes her hand and he's like crying and he's you know and he walks away. There's but undoubtedly there is a weirdness, a weirdness to, to that. that. Right. Yeah. It was uh, it was definitely uncomfortable territory. Mm-hmm. I mean, however, we should watch uh, all the little children at some point. Nah, Maybe not. I'm okay. <laughs> Patreon exclusive. Patreon exclusive. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, when you watch that movie, they're they're just taking it like d- diving head on into it. Right. With this movie, I feel like there. Yeah, but there definitely was a bit where I was like, I don't know mm. how I feel about this. Right. This is weird. Maybe have her be at daycare and you just talk to her mom. Right, yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Go play on the swing sets, honey. <laughs> yeah, Jesus. I mean, yeah. So, I don't know. So, I was like, well, you've got her address. Just call your lawyer. Call your lawyer. Jeez. Um, I also thought it was weird. He slips and falls on the ice, cracks his head. Right? Bleeding. Puts him he's in the drawer. He's bleeding. And she's like, he's like, you got to put me in the drawer. You got to put me in the drawer. And he's like, blam. And it, he's to he, get him downstairs into the jacket and into the drawer. That's probably enough time to like treat the head wound. That's killing him. I would say him. that you probably could have saved his life. Yeah, he probably didn't have to die, Jennifer Jason Lee. If you you know put some pressure on it, uh, call mean, a real maybe. She's don't... a doctor, doctor, right? right? She's like she's a doctor. She's at a medical facility. She's like, oh my god, this guy slipped and fell. I'm gonna take half an hour to get to him put downstairs. Put him in a morgue drawer. Into a jacket, into a morgue drawer, inject him with chemicals. I don't fucking know. Yeah. Maybe she's just so like. Stunned that he is actually apparently able to time travel since she knew about the electroconvulsive stuff. Right. But where she's just like, I, I don't know. I guess you I know guess. what he's talking about. Just don't turn me into the bounty hunter. You know, right. I, <laughs> my gang's gonna come and fuck you up. <laughs> but no, she. Uh, they put him in the drawer. Yeah, I'm they like, put him in the drawer. That, like, why like... are you doing this? <laughs> He's in desperate need of exactly. medical attention. Can you please see to the bleeding head wound? Staunch the wound, and then we'll talk. Right. Since every time he comes out of this drawer, he's on death's door, maybe now is not the time. The time to- I understand that narratively, obviously, you put him in the drawer you and give him to, a chance. So he can to- have- right. And then, of course, we get to do that beautiful fade to light. That means that he's passed. However, that all said, mm-hmm. I really, really enjoyed the future when he doesn't go back what we've seen so far although they are breaking their own fucking rules by doing this um christmas eve he goes to christmas eve in 2007 yeah. christmas day he goes to christmas, christmas day, day in 2007 in this one it's new year's day in the real world and he goes back to christmas eve in 2007 not at the end no because she says happy new year to her mom on the oh phone. but they're just somehow replicating right okay yeah she it's the same thought, that she's, she always gets coffee at that place on her way gotcha to okay so i just missed it i thought that it was it was such an exact it was, it was replication that right. he was going back to the beginning of his no, time i thought the, the same thing too until the happy new year she says I didn't happy think new year on the until, phone i think to, i missed it actually because yeah. i was just sitting there like look she's got a bug now so right. she's better <laughs> she better yeah that's, that's how you that's how you know she's not driving to beat up bronco anymore she's driving I have a new beetle. To be so fair, that's, life is that better. was not my observation. That was Bird's observation. She's like, oh, I made oh, that observation. Oh, her life is together now because she drives a VW. <laughs> right. mm. mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's how you know. How do we know that she's not going to, you know, nurse Jackie at her job right now? Right. I'm seriously. Like, Touche. Touche. <laughs> and, you know, substance abuse runs. But the it's family. the phone call that ties that all up. Right. Her mom is fine. Her mom is fine. They but, uh, have reconciled or whatever. She is a nurse at a hospital. I liked some of the stuff that that scene suggested, which is like. Um, even if you change the past, it doesn't intrinsically change the person that you are in the future. In the past, or um, I'm sorry, in future one, she's like all fucking drunk and she works as a waitress and she's driving a, mm-hmm. a Bronco, which is that perennial favorite of drug abusers. Right. You know, every every drug abuser drives a Bronco. <laughs> I mean, you know, she takes a blast off a bottle while she's you know about while to drive, driving. but she still does stop and pick him up. That's true. And in the future, she's the same thing. So either way, she's still the person that she is. He hasn't changed her. He's just changed her circumstances. Exactly. I liked that a lot. And I loved the dream catcher that she has hanging from her yes. mirror. I was yes. like, look at that fucking little metaphor little symbol. Ding-a-ding. I'm wondering, is that like, do you think that that's a hint it's a of dream. sorts? Yep. So is that their way of saying, and it was all a dream? Wink, wink. Yep. I think so. I, don't, I think not even being subtle about it. Yeah, because it's a obviously a choice, and it's a dream catcher, and it's kind of out of character for her. For her at that point, absolutely, especially, especially if her life is better now, right? Like, what? So that doesn't make any sense other than, hey, audience, 
it was it all was a, a dream. dream. But, you know, you can't do that because if you say it was all a dream, the only time you can do that is Inception because you're Christopher because, Nolan. Well, that and you're, <laughs> you're stating that as the rules of the movie in the first is place. Is that it's all a dream, right? You're not like, hey, we're going to leave the audience to guess whether or not this is a dream. We say in the they're dreaming. So this movie so is this about is people a, who are dreaming. dreaming okay. A, and we're going to set some very clear rules and about, guidelines about, about how that works. dreaming movie that we're making where at the end... There. I like that actually at the end of Inception, rather than going and it was all a dream, they're like, they might still be dreaming. They might still be dreaming, exactly. <laughs> they leave you like, what the that fuck? That totem is still spinning, bro. Yeah, still, I'm like, oh, spinning. can you just show me like the next five seconds of right. footage where it either falls or doesn't? You yeah. fuck. You wobble, wobble. Bastard. That's all you get. You get a wobble, little wobble, wobble. A little wobble. Tip. Oh, what a good movie. But this movie was good too. Um,. <laughs> <laughs> Another George Clooney production. It was. <clears throat> was produced by George Clooney as Warner we, Independent. Warner Independent. And this one had Soderbergh on it as well. As well. Mm -hmm. I um okay, at the time of recording we I have not rewatched The Machinist or seen In the Mouth of Madness. I know In the Mouth of Madness is not a Warner Independent, but I'm no, curious. It's not. Is the machine is the machinist? Warner Independent? I think that it is. Did we pick three I Warner think we might have. Oh my God! Can about we? crazy people from Hold the mid two thousands. <laughs> We're gonna do a live IMDb yeah, search. Yeah, you here. look it up because if it is, my God, uh, we would have. Uh, all of the good crazy people movies were made uh, in 2005 I, and 2006. The produced by George Clooney. Machinist. Yeah. 2004, I, we're in the wheelhouse. Okay, so we're of, in the... We would have a movie from 2004, 5, and 6. Uh, writer, cast, company. crew, it's got... Co how do you, how do you drive this company. fucking thing? I don't know. I will <laughs> I will start wrapping up our... Uh, Fantastic. I, I, would, I would definitely recommend this film... Um, I will just say right now, I haven't rewatched it, but The Machinist of the movies that we've watched, I think will probably end up being my favorite. <laughs> we're, t we're doing time travel right now. <laughs> it is It is not. At least it's not. It's not a Warner. Clooney. Is it well, not a Warner? Know. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know. I like to scan her darkly a little bit more than this movie. I, I agree. Um, I mean, I the the jacket was a interesting movie. I mean, it, it was like I said, it was a couple different things. It was a it was a who done it. It was a we're gonna make this person crazy movie, and it. But at the end of the day, it's it's just kind of okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would give this a solid. Like, it was enjoyable. Oh yeah. I'm not probably gonna watch it again. Hmm. No, we're um, scanner. I probably in a couple of years watch again because of. Yeah, yeah, and know. like, um, I, I I was talking to Bird, and I was like, uh, for this month, should I watch all of these movies like super stoned? And she's like, No, you fucking moron. <laughs> They're all movies about people losing their minds and having mental breakdowns. Probably not a good idea. No, it's a terrible idea. I don't know why it crossed my mind at all, but um. I was really messed up the first time I saw Natural Born Killers, and I still haven't recovered from it. That's a trippy it. movie, too. No That's shit. really... So what did, when you were watching the bit with uh, Rodney Repet Dangerfield... Repetition Wax, David. Repetition Wax, David. Fuck, fuck you, movie. <laughs> when you're watching the... Uh, I, for me, the, I would have been like, the moment Rodney Mickey Dangerfield comes out, Mops. I'd be like, oh, look, it's Rodney Dangerfield. Why is he being so mean? Why is he so mean? Oh, my God, he's a rapist. What? This is Rodney Dangerfield. Yep. I would have thought I was hallucinating. Yep. Or uh, In a Scanner Darkly, total, 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 totally, total, totally fortuitous. Yep. <laughs> like Robert Downey Jr. would have broken my brain. Yep. But no, um, yeah, so I've watched, I will watch all of these movies utterly level. There will be a lot Sober. of meditation afterwards. Yep, exactly. Grounding myself in maybe a Nicholas Sparks novel or something. <sighs> I don't fucking no. A walk to remember. I'd give this, I'd give this probably three out of five stars. We don't have to get into the solid, habit of solid rating C plus. them. No, no, but, but this is like, a, this would be like a C plus for me. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's stuff here. The performances were good. Yeah. This was not a watch again just to see Daniel Day Lewis's thin, thin sneer and the hardness of his eyes. Right. This is not watching Tom Hardy act with the minute mus muscles of his eyebrow. You know, like right. this is not that. This is not powerhouse knock out of the park. This is if you want to see something interesting that, that raises some questions and is kind of a good mystery, kind of a good like it psych almost, psychological. It thriller. almost feels like Inception Light in a way. Kind of, yeah. We're building layers and stuff, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, it doesn't know it if it wants like... to be Cuckoo's Nest or if it wants to be Inception or if it wants to be right. You know, but but I I nothing against it. I liked nope. this movie. I thought all the performances were solid. The cinematography was okay, mm -hmm. um, and we got a good conversation on it. Absolutely. All right, so as is our want, I'm going to come up with a shitty outro. Oh, what's going to be this outro. time? Uh, this time it's going to be, all right, everyone, get your feet off the seats and stop touching your meat. <laughs> 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 okay. 
catch you next week. That'll work. That'll work.